Now, obviously, as you have pictured here, uh, the, the key point in, in this discussion is that pretty much most everything we can look at, even in psychology, will have these three components. The, the psychological influences, the biological influences, and the social slash cultural influences. That's also true in the, the, the final days when we talk about death and dying because that as you grow older, it becomes more and more apparent that it is, in a sense, the end of all men. Uh, all of us uh, will experience death, not only vicariously through other people who die, but also our own. And the one thing that, that I, I want to comment on, just to put some things in perspective, is that in the book of Ecclesiastes, the author spends an interesting amount of time talking about death and mourning. Uh, and one of the things he says that I think is quite interesting is that in the house of mourning, there is wisdom, which to most of us, when we talk about mourning itself, we think of unhappiness and grief and so forth. But what the author of Ecclesiastes, in spite of how dark you might see that particular book, he says there's wisdom because we grapple with life's real questions, um, life's real questions of reality and the end of life and the beginning of life and who is, uh, who's, who owns what, in a sense, when we talk about life itself. One of the key points, at least in late adulthood, is uh, the, the aspect of widowhood and um, widower. Now, women generally uh, outlive men. On average, uh, they outlive their men five to seven years, which means that um, women are, are left as a widow longer and therefore have a greater need for various support systems that come into play. But widowhood and widower uh, both uh, uh, afflict the older uh, when their spouse uh, passes away. And there's a greater and greater need, really, of, of uh, um, support for uh, people in this particular category. The other thing to keep in mind, again, we return to the uh, social clock, is that, uh, and this was probably most uh, strongly emphasized and, and seen in... Um, uh, in the shootings this past July in Colorado is that uh, a, a life well lived and death follows that we are not nearly as outraged as we are a life cut short and uh, by that very phrase we are saying that uh, it should have been longer even though we don't know if it should be lo longer. Scripture tells us that our days are numbered. And numbered by who? By implication, God. He knows our number, and we complete that number, uh, even though we may have an idea, based on the social clock, as to how many those days are. And so it, it creates a sense, an appropriate sense of urgency in terms of knowing that our days are numbered. There's a solace there. It's firmly in God's hands. But on the back side, on the other side of that, is that we don't know what that number is, so how are we going to live life? So the social clock is, is part of the backdrop of talking about, um, talking about uh, the, how we manage our grief and so forth. Now, on that basis, let me just take a short bunny trail here to talk you through some of the things and issues that come up uh, during grief and grieving. Um, and this is a apt time because um, uh, you might see your parents go through it or have seen them go through it as a parent, their parents die. In a lot of ways, your parents uh, are in what we call the sandwich generation. They're not only taking care of their parents, but they're also taking you care of you as their, as their children. And when we talk about grief, uh, there are a variety of, of um, stages, stages like approaches, okay? 
Elizabeth Kubler Ross came up with a, a stage like approach and and I adapted it uh, in order to help people understand grief and she always starts with denial and denial doesn't mean uh, just it isn't happening it has a lot to do with the meaning of the the person's death to me and so it's not so much this can't be happening, it's what effect or impact does this have on me? And when I deny that it has no meaning, when I'm closely related to this person, then, then I'm, I'm probably in denial. Um, the second one uh, is anger, and, and anger that specifically is turned uh, outward. And we have a sense of outrage and anger toward those people that could have, should have done more to save the person that we have lost. And so anger turns outward and then uh, it also turns inward. It turns in on myself. Um, and we, the way we experience this is we feel regret. And uh, we often experience or have something that I call as the if onlys. If only I had been there when the person needed me the most. If only I had shared Christ with them. If only, if only, and all of that is anger turned inward. The thing to keep in mind with these three stages, um, I refer to these as the pain containment stages. And the reason I say that is that all three of these stages mark an unwillingness and a stubborn unwillingness to accept the reality of what we've lost. And so all, all our effort really is to, to contain the pain that we feel um, in, in the grief that we feel. So sometimes it's denying it, sometimes it's turning our anger out at the people that should have behaved or turning it in on ourselves. And the thing to keep in mind when we're talking about this is that this becomes kind of a cycle uh, that we cycle through over and over again uh, while we try to process our pain. Before long, if we have help and support, a lot of times we begin to experience genuine grief, which is really processing fully the meaning of what has happened to us in losing that person. And so what that means is, is that this uh, uh, cycle here goes this way and begins to dip farther and farther and farther down into this as we cycle through um, the meaning of grief over time and what we've lost, how we've lost it, what we're without, what we don't have anymore, what we miss the most, etc. And during that time, by the time this process continues, uh, we finally get to some measure of what often people will refer to as resolution. Now that doesn't mean back to normal. Uh, it means reaching a new normal without the person in it. And so in a lot of ways, the way to think about uh, grief is that life proceeds and the uh, loss occurs here. And then we begin to go down and cycle through a variety of motions as we go down and we hit this bottom point where the genuine grief begins to set in. And as we do, we begin then to move forward upward until we reach this new norm that um, is life without the person in it. And that's more realistic uh, in understanding. In a lot of cases, you could put it through uh, not just these stages, but through a uh, cyclical um, understanding of grief that probably fits our, uh, our uh, understanding of seasons even better. So in a sense, when a person dies, it's winter. Uh, when our, our uh, uh, feelings begin to reawaken and we feel all the pain, it's spring. And when we do the hardest work, which is also summer, and when color finally returns to our world, uh, we can refer to that as then fall again. And that, 
that may be more realistic because the reality is is we cycle through these emotions even after the person has died after many years and that doesn't mean we haven't finished our grieving it just means that they were very important and we have anniversary dates and things like that that impact us through the cycle of the seasons that we go through in life itself